Hey everyone, uh, this is going to be something a little different today. No Nat Ones over on his channel posed an interesting question about tabletop role-playing games and whether or not the industry as a whole has peaked. I wanted to see what he had to say about it and then give my thoughts and takes on this as well. So let's go see what he has to say. Have tabletop role-playing games peaked? Or as potentially a better question, can tabletop role-playing games peak? I would say ultimately, I know we haven't even really gotten started, but no, maybe we're already in kind of a golden age of tabletop games like right now. Now, I want to preface by saying this is not a scientific video. You know, I'm not going to be comparing metrics of popularity of the genre, of different systems within the genre, or even anything of the like. I'm more so talking about the idea that I'm not going to bore you with numbers. Obviously, tabletop role-playing games are as big as they have ever been, especially with lockdown a few years back and the explosion of online role-playing sessions. More people are playing D&D, Pathfinder, Call of Cthulhu, or whatever you prefer, more than ever before, ever since the introduction of role-playing games. This I would agree with. We're, like I said, we're kind of in that golden age of role-playing games. We are, uh, they're more accessible, they're more socially acceptable now than they ever were before. And then you have the advent of online systems. You have um, the online capabilities, so they are more accessible now than they ever were before. What used to be a really niche hobby only played by a very small subsect of people is now pretty much normalized and played by a pretty large percentage of the world population, at least in comparison to what it used to be. It's obviously nothing close to the video game tyrant or things like that, but compared to where role-playing was even 10 years ago, the change is astronomical. So I yes, guess the question yes, is, I would agree is with that. this astronomical growth going to continue, or will it subside, or has it already subsided? And a sort of tan... It's, it's a little tough to say because we're kind of already, like I said, at a, at a peak, we're at a high point. So Dungeons and Dragons is obviously one of the more prominent versions of this. It's the most popular game, but you have content creators, people who are making videos and third-party products for D&D, for other games. You have an explosion of people creating their own tabletop games. No matter how popular they're going to be, they are creating these products. So I, yes, we're, we're kind of at a pinnacle of it right now. You could almost argue that the the TTRPG space is over flooded with people trying to create their own games, put new spins on things. How much of a new spin can you put on rolling dice? Well, we'll I guess we'll see. Gentle question alongside that is whether or not the quality of these games is going to increase with their popularity. Well, I suppose we should take this roughly one question at a time, and I guess the good place to start is the quality of these games. Are role-playing games now better presented and better written than their older counterpart? I would say yes. You have a better understanding. More people have a better understanding of game fundamentals, game design, game principles. So the RPGs that we play now... I feel are better designed than they were before. Also, before you were kind of in the like the Wild West, like the early days of of D and D, when that was kind of the only, <laughs> the pun intended, the only game in town. Yeah, like whatever whatever you needed, you made up. Whatever you didn't want, you forgot, and you you just kind of went about your day. That fundamental hasn't changed. You'll notice I'm going to specifically avoid the word better because there's a lot of personal preference when it comes to what type of system is better, but there is something to be said for the quality and presentation of the material, which allows someone to both enter and enjoy it. Well, for one thing, in modern... What I do like about No Nat Ones when he talks and when he presents information, he's very open to the systems. It's not my system is better or Pathfinder is better than D&D. He actually just did a video on this too, where he chastise people in some of the <laughs> different communities to say, 
stop having system wars, stop a flame war. It's okay to like things. And I, I, I like his approach to this. It's, it's kind of the same as mine. If you like a system, great, go play it, go have fun. That's what this is all about. Today, the rules for the biggest titans of the industry, D&D, Pathfinder, and a few others, are all available so easily. You know, back in the day, especially before the advent of the internet, you would have to find the rule books. You know, you would have to probably go to a local yes. game store. Which the early days, if you, you had to know someone who had the books because they were very difficult to find. Which I assume game stores were around in the 80s. You'd have to hope or that a store stores. somewhere near you had the book so you could buy it or hope you had a friend who had the book. And I feel like that was a lot more of the regular back in the 80s and 90s. You know, everyone would gather at the one person's house who owned the books. And that person was also probably usually the dungeon master. I grew up in a small town. I don't even know where you found these books. Like you probably had to go to a bigger city, a bigger outlet to find these things. Uh, until they started being, until hobby shops, gaming shops became more popular, it was very difficult to find books. Nowadays, everyone has access to everything, whether it's through Archives of Nethys, D&D Beyond, or what- Archives of Nethys, whether you play Pathfinder or Starfinder, great resource, and they've just partnered with Paizo. Whatever program you choose to use, now it's not always free, but it is always right at the click of a few buttons. Right now, even though I only own like two pieces of D&D 5e material, I could go online and buy the entire collection, hit charge, and I would have every piece of 5e official content within 10 minutes. This is a huge reason why RPGs have proliferated, especially with the lockdown, because the online accessibility is there. Same goes for Pathfinder 2e. All the rules are for free, but if I wanted to get all of the adventures and everything Paizo's written, same idea. Go to paizo.com, put it all in my cart, and I have it all right then and there. Online accessibility. So just from an accessibility standpoint, I would say that RPGs are leagues ahead of where they used to be. Even compared to something like 2005 to 2010, you know, you don't need to go to Newberry Comics to get your player's handbook anymore. You can just go either to D&D Beyond and get it right then and there, or go to Amazon and get it shipped to your door in two days. So Amazon has really helped uh, RPGs, love them or hate them. I don't like to spend my money on Amazon, but the the offering of one day shipping for for books or or same day shipping is very difficult to beat and no not and not paying for shipping if you have the like the prime subscriptions that much is obvious but also there's the question of the new player experience as well as the veteran experience are these new systems both welcoming to new players and engaging enough to veterans? And once again, this is going to be very, very opinionated on a case-by-case -case basis. Some people are going to say that yeah. 5e was perfect for them because it was their first system. It gave them just enough to work with. They weren't overwhelmed and they can do whatever they want with it. Which is From what I've heard, 5e is a very good system. I haven't played it yet, but it's uh, good in the sense that it's rules light compared to things like Pathfinder or Starfinder, and easier to pick up, is more uh, new person friendly. It's great, but a lot of veterans think 5e is a little bit too simplistic, especially compared to 3rd edition preceding it. I know 4th edition existed, but I don't know anything about it, so I don't want to talk about it. So these people who wanted the crunch and wanted those numbers just Wise didn't really choice. get it out of 5th edition. But there's also something to talk about as well, and that is that these old systems still exist. D&D 3.5, Pathfinder 1st Edition, hell, even D&D 4th Edition still have active player bases, yes. and you can still gain access to these system supplements and core rulebooks and everything even easier than you could when they were in their prime. Yes. You know, when 3.5 was in its prime, you still probably needed to get the player's handbook from your local games. In, in addition to this, there are... 3.5 being very popular, Neverwinter Nights, the original PC game, which was built off of the, the, the bones of 3.5, there's still people that play that game. That is a very old game. Store, whereas now you can find it online. 
for that reason, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if the amount of people, stay with me, if the amount of people playing 3.5 right now is actually equal to or more people than it was 20 years ago. That's an interesting question. It would be nice to see some stats on that, although I don't know how you would do that. Now, percentage-wise, it is obviously much lower. Yes. A lot of people move on to the newest system. You know, if you're talking about D&D, chances are you are talking about 5th edition. But 3.5 still has its diehard fans, and I'm sure there are people every day who are looking into yes. it and are finding that it is the system for them. So once again, not... Those who have it and are the diehards, they're going to play it no matter what. They may try the new the new system, the new expansions, but they're going to stick with their love and they can still, I mean, the books are as, they last as long as you can keep a book. So you can introduce new people to that all the time. And you can even have the reverse. So if somebody enjoyed fifth edition, having somebody who was into fourth or 3.5, it'd be, you could have that conversation with them and say, Hey, if you like this and you wanted a little bit more crunch while still being familiar, try this. Not only are the new systems accessible to everybody, but the old systems are more accessible than they used to be. So people yes. can truly find the... We just kind of, I just kind of touched on that as with the online, the, those older systems are also accessible uh, with like digital products and things. A perfect system for them. If they want something super bare bones, D&D First Edition, the rules are out there. You can get the rules cyclopedia, which is technically like D&D 1.5, but you can get that five minutes. Go to drive through RPG, hit pay. You've got the rules cyclopedia from the A. Print on demand was fantastic. It still is fantastic. Drive through RPG is a great resource for many game systems. And you can... And, and drive through RPG did not exist back in the early days, right? The, the thought of print-on-demand for books or for rules was just not something that existed. Play as an elf. Not the race, the class elf. And then there's the representation. You know, the first really big one for the mainstream of tabletop role-playing game was probably Stranger Things. You know, that season one where, yeah. oh, look at these 13-year-olds in the 80s playing Dungeons. In, in addition to these shows that are recreating the experience of playing D&D, they're recreating it faithfully enough that it gives someone who is curious about it, they can actually see what it's like behind the scenes. And dragons, wow. Critical Role did this as well. Oh. And that's what made a lot of people curious, especially because we live in an era of binging TV shows, you know, people watched the entirety of season one where D&D &D was a pretty decent factor in the entire story to the point where it got them interested. I, you know, if they watched one episode a week, maybe Stranger it would never be enough yet. to push them over that edge to start researching D&D. &D. But Stranger Things, also coupled with the very soon pandemic leading to lockdown, was kind of a perfect storm to let people research role-playing games. When you have time to kill from all the lockdowns, Role-playing games are perfect for that. And one of the first thing that these people were usually pulled to. And whole industries have been created out of this. So the online, the online tabletop space, so many companies are creating their own virtual tabletops because of the pandemic. Now there may be some fallout or maybe a little bit of slowdown in this, but if you've, they've whole industries have been birthed around role-playing games. What's critical role? Now, your yes. stance on You'd critical role could be positive, this. could be negative, could be neutral. Doesn't matter. You cannot deny the pop culture impact critical yes. role had. We now had. An I like critical role. I like what they've done for popularizing tabletop games. Um, I don't like that they've become the gold standard of what role playing games should be like. It, not everybody is a professional voice actor. And so I think it can be a little off-putting for some new people if they're using that as their experience. Oh, I have to do this. I have to be these great role players. No, you don't. You don't even have to know the rules. Just learn it as you go. You, you learn by playing. An actual watchable experience of how people play Dungeons and Dragons. You know, you watch Stranger through, Things. Yes, you watch Futurama. You might see them play D&D &D here and there. But it's not real D&D, &D. you know, it's, it's, it's scripted, it's, it's performed, which 
There's arguments for critical role, but it's a very different type. You know, this is a script. Critical role is much more like a bullet point of stuff that is planned to happen. You know, much like a campaign. <laughs> so with Stranger Things, it, with yes. critical role, with the global lockdown, TTRPGs just had this amazing springboard into the mainstream. And yes. with that came so many new people, so many people playing for the first time, so many people on Twitter saying they're DMing for the first time. I was um, starting to DM before the lockdowns happened, but I was uh, inspired by some of my some of the people that I watch on YouTube, Matt Coville was one DM who inspired me with with his videos and the way he talked about using rules and spicing up your games, campaigns, things like that. Matt Coville was an inspiration for me to uh, to to want to start GMing. And then I played Starfinder and well, we all know where things kind of went from there ever in 2020 and looking for advice and seeing so many cool people come together and give them cool advice. You know, some of it could be a bit um, uh, overwhelming, a bit ambitious, but you know, it was just awesome. The TTRPG community take a few things that you together, can do and then build on and that. And it was really, really wholesome to see all of it jumping out into the mainstream and seeing it become so much more publicly available is the wrong word, but available. I would say the word you were looking for is accessible, available works, um, socially acceptable as well. So with people who are looking to kill some time, you finally have, uh, you finally have a new outlet for that. It's like, Hey, you know, let's spend an evening because we can't go out anywhere. Let's, uh, let's make up some stories. Let's tell some stories. Storytelling is one of the oldest human pastimes in existence. Human storytelling will never lose its popularity. You know, I'm not just talking the material, but the genre, the medium of the role-playing game became much more publicly available. What was once just called Dungeons and Dragons, which was that basement game for nerds, was suddenly much more understood as a collaborative, cooperative storytelling experience. And from there, once you have people who understand what it is, you get more people that want to join it, and then you have less uh, less gatekeepers who are part of that, I guess. Uh, you know, less gatekeepers is always a good thing. Once people experience D&D 5e, which was a perfect level of complexity for a new player, they could start looking elsewhere. I know tons of people who started D&D back in like 2018, 2019, and have since moved on to things like Pathfinder 2e in modern day because they wanted it to be a little more complicated. They might've moved on to Call of Cthulhu to have more relevant elements of mechanics Call of Cthulhu is a very popular game. Uh, I haven't played it. I have played many tabletop systems, many tabletop games, probably close to seven or eight. I, I think that's many, but different games, different, different storytelling systems. To tell a, a horror, an eldritch story. Maybe they actually found D&D 5e too complicated, which is completely fine. So they found something like Fate Core or what is it? Kids on Bikes, Monster of the Week. Those ones are a little bit more simple than D&D 5e. I haven't played Kids on Bikes. And much more focused on the storytelling. A lot of people might not even have found D&D 5e too complicated. They World of Darkness is a storytelling system. So you only need the 10-sided dice. And it uses pools, so it's it's very simple. The rules and mechanics are very, very easy on across all the games in the World of Darkness. I just might have found the, the mechanics and the feats and the level progression and all of that to just be not fun. So a bunch of these other indie RPGs got a nice spotlight on them when people realized, hey, there are other games. There's other Dungeons options. and Dragons didn't just mean Dungeons and Dragons. And that's when they learned that people people use Dungeons and Dragons as kind of like Kleenex. It's a brand name for a varying degrees of product. When I try to explain tabletop games to people who don't know what they are, Dungeons and Dragons is usually the example that I give because at least they have some idea of what you're doing, sitting around tables, storytelling, make believe. If you say I'm playing Starfinder and nobody's played Starfinder. Well, what's, what's that? And you have to, well, it's like Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, okay. There was a whole TTRPG world out there leading to that huge community boom. 
And of course, with that boom, there has come a lot of arguments, system it's superiority and what have you, but that's just the nature of the beast. You know, you look at the console wars of the 90s, you look yeah. at Marvel versus... Console wars are still insane now. If you like something that's, that I don't like, great. Go enjoy yourself. As long as it's not hurting anyone. DC, anything with even slightly competing IPs will have a system war, as it were. And it's unfortunate, but it's also a sign of growth. And I think that's really, really cool. It's you know, it's not take. necessarily positive growth, but being an unavoidable bump in the road, it shows that TTRPGs are so much bigger than they were before. Yes. You know, back in 2014, you might have seen, oh, we fight over 5e versus 3.5. But now you see people arguing 5e, 2e, 3.5, Call of Cthulhu, Shadowrun, Delta Green, um, others, 7th C, I don't know, I'm bad on the spot. Monster of the Week, Kids on Bikes. Exalted. Savage Worlds, they're all, the Starfinder, there's so many. He said it, he said Starfinder. Out there, and the fact that people are talking about so many games, and it's so easy to find people talking about your game is incredible and we're circling all the way back around to the accessibility of the genre which is that people now have access to other people now yes. if you're 15 16 years old and trying to get into D, &D if no one at your it's much easier to find groups because you're before you were limited to in person now with online and things like roll 20 uh fantasy grounds you you have so many more options for finding groups discord to just communicate with people. School plays, you might not be out of luck. You might be able to find an organized play on Pathfinder Society or an Adventurer's League at a local game store or something like that because the internet has connected all of us. So what used to be a hobby that could only be shared with those who lived close to you or maybe if you were in college, you happened to be in the same dorm, you could run a campaign. And it's interesting that uh, Dungeons and Dragons is actually starting to be used for therapy or in, in exploring kids who have social anxieties that they can come out of their shells a little bit because they can either present a version of themselves in the game or just become someone completely different. And it's OK. So I think that is kind of a neat concept as well. Now. You can play online, and then there's all of the, the Roll20, the Foundry, the Fantasy Grounds, everything you can use to augment that online experience, which has been getting better and better every year, especially in the past two years, making the entire online experience more streamlined, more customizable. You know, on Foundry, you can customize your own digital dice. You can do lighting and sound effects whenever you mm -hmm. cast certain spells. I mentioned entire industries being born out of this, uh, being born out of this golden age, if you will, of RPGs. The online RPG scene has evolved in the last two years, and it's so cool to see. And it's not for everyone. You know, I still miss and prefer playing in person. I also prefer playing in person, but the online is definitely a, a, a great second. But I know people, some personal friends of mine, who spend hours every day making macros, making maps, making super cool stuff that when their players get if to that section, thing, they man. can press a button and on the map, it looks like a live fire comes to life in the cauldron and emits a glow that has a built-in lighting effect with a music cue and sound effect. And it's they're so proud of it and it augments their entire experience and their group loves it. And it's a Immersion whole is, new dynamic to tabletop role-playing games that didn't exist five years ago. And it's so cool that something that's been around for 50 years now is still having these moments, these shifts in evolution where some whole new aspect. I think we're still going to see more evolution within the space. The problem with that is you don't know what that's going to be. Um, I do have some concerns and we'll see if he touches on that. And we'll we'll see if he touches on any of those comes to the table, no pun intended. So have tabletop role playing games peaked? Is this the limit? Like the obvious answer is no. The games are still being made. 
that's right. Games are still being made. It's a more saturated space than it was now, which is a good thing because you have options. It's a bad thing because just because you're making an RPG game doesn't mean it's going to be successful. Content is still being put out. New people are still joining every day. Foundry and Roll20, well, Foundry is updating daily, adding new modules, new everything. I don't think we've peaked, but there is obviously the fact that the world is returning to normal. There's a lot of pushback now for uh, companies who want their people to go back into the office. So you're going to start seeing some of those those times uh, that that free time is going to be sucked back to going back to work. I don't think it's going to go fully that way. I think people have shifted the mindset a little bit around the blends between work life balance. So while I think you may see some pushback in people going back to office and commuting, I don't think it's going to swing back 100%. People are back at work. People are back to their Monday through Friday. Lockdown is over. Free time is a lot less common again, similar to pre-lockdown. But people are going to want that back. Because of that, people might not have the time to dive into these games anymore. You know, a lot of them, luckily, were able to spend those hours of free times while their jobs weren't safe. You know, they were able to study the rulebook, learn how to dungeon master, learn how to make characters, learn how to play Call of Cthulhu. But now that their free time is restricted by their in-office job hours again, I'm curious if we're going to see a fall-off in players. Probably. I definitely won't be surprised whatsoever if, you know, the Roll20 and Foundry analytics show a very large chunk of lost player base in the next two years. But I think we can look past that at the alternative, which the baseline will definitely be higher, I think is very likely. A lot of those lost players are still going to be playing. They're just going to be playing in person now that they and their friends have had a chance to learn and engage with the tabletop experience. And now they can. And the people like myself who want to go back to playing in person, you're going to do that. So you're going to lose that online aspect. And when you're not online, there's nothing to track. But I, I think there's going to be more people playing these games. Play it in person. They can actually get the authentic old school feeling of actually playing at a table with miniatures and clickety clack math rocks because online <laughs> dice don't have that satisfying chuckle. They don't. There is, you can randomize, you could have the perfect dice randomizer. It doesn't feel as good as throwing something on the table. So no, I do not believe TTRPGs have peaked. However, I don't know where we're going from here. You know, now that we've had the ability to completely augment our online games to have these sound effects and lighting cues and macros, how does that evolution translate to the table? I think you might see some VR integration. VR is kind of clumsy right now, but I think that would be the next evolution of it. I don't know how that would work. I don't see how that would work, but that seems to be the next interactive level of it well there are a lot of cool products coming out i'm not sponsored by any of them i think one's called game board and a lot of others are trying to make these really fancy tabletops i mean some companies are actually selling digital gaming tables which are like a computer and a screen built into your gaming table you're going to see a lot of hobbyists um making their own digital game tables as well so you can load up like an online map onto your physical table and like put minis on it and move around. So you're playing in person, but you've still got the power of these virtual tabletops right in front of you. So yes. I think that's the next evolution in the next few years. I think we're going to see all of these revelations and advancements in online tabletops find a way to come to that's the an interesting physical take. tabletop to give that level of advanced gameplay the question is, how expensive is that going to be? Very. But that's a question for another day, because that is about 20 minutes of rambling. But 
Let me know what you think. Do you think TTRPGs have peaked? Do you think they peaked back in the 2000s, the 90s? Do you think AD&D was the top of the line, the best time to play the game? Let me know in the comments below. You know I love hearing from you, even if some of you are very aggressive. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Yes, comment section is nuts. Watching. Huge shout out to my patrons for helping keep the channel alive. If you would like to support the channel, there is a link in the description to my Patreon where you can get your name on this ever-growing list. Thank you all so much for watching. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, no nat ones. I like no nat. He's got a, a good online presence. He has uh, some pretty level headed ideas and, and the way he presents information is very good. Um, some of the things he didn't talk about that I was concerned about is consolidation within the TTRPG space. Um, we've seen that a little bit with with uh, Wizards of the Coast and and the blending of D and D archive, not D and D archives, the D and D online, whatever whatever resource I can't the name totally. My mind is drawing a total blank on that. You'll have some of the bigger companies potentially buying rights or uh, buying some of the different games. You're gonna see some of that. Some of the major players being Paizo, being Wizards of the Coast, the biggest one, Hasbro. It's not a concern yet. It hasn't been a problem of companies going on this buying spree for rights and things like that. But we'll we'll see what happens with that. So that's that's a concern that I have of mine with that. And then maybe the over flooding of everybody making their own TTRPG games, which I I think is great. You want to promote creativity. You want to promote innovation and new ideas for for role playing games. You don't want to be stagnant. But again, how many times can you reinvent the wheel? I don't know, but uh, we're definitely, I definitely feel that we're in a golden age of role-playing games. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, hit the like and subscribe button. I haven't done any reaction videos before, but I, I'm interested in seeing how it goes. Um, let me know what you think. My name's Nathaniel. Thanks for stopping by, everyone.